Chapter 23, Nathaniel War heats up. In January 2008, Gavin Newsom was enjoying the overwhelming victory of his second mayoral election just two months before, when he won with 72% of the popular vote. The election results weren't much as a surprise to anyone since Newsom's two main challengers on the ballot were George Davis, a nude activist and author of the book Naked Yoga, and Michael Powers, owner of the infamous power exchange sex club in the Tenderloin. With another four-year mayoral term ahead of him, Newsom was widely considered to already have his eye on the next big thing. And what was the most likely big step for such an ambitious political climber? Why not governor of California, the most popular state in the union, with an economy the size of a major nation? SFPD under Newsom's administration still had an abysmally bad record of investigating and solving violent crime. A blue ribbon panel report released in the middle of his first term exposed a myriad of deep-seated problems within the city's police department, including leadership failure, communication breakdown, low morale, politics and mistrust. These weren't the kind of crime-fighting creds that would help win big votes among the law and order crowd in the larger California body politic, especially outside of San Francisco. Newsom's law enforcement credentials would require some brushing up if he was going to be taken seriously for statewide office. The field of competitors would certainly be more formidable than a nude activist or the proprietor of a sex club, which is the reason why some observers reckon he picked Kevin Ryan to head the mayor's Office of Criminal Justice soon after his reelection. Appointed U.S. Attorney for Northern California by President George W. Bush in 2002, Ryan made national headlines as the prosecutor in the Balco steroids case involving San Francisco Giants home run slugger Barry Bonds. The Bonds case was characterized by a high degree of self-promotion on the part of Ryan, as well as an ill-conceived prosecution strategy that targeted a small-scale steroid supplier and a handful of celebrity athletes. In the end, the main illegal supplier of the steroids in the case took a walk in exchange for testifying against Bonds. Ryan eventually was canned as U.S. Attorney in December 2006 by the Bush administration, basically for rank incompetence as the head of DOJ's office in Northern California. In a scathing report released by the Justice Department, Ryan was determined to have presided over an office characterized as retaliatory, explosive, non-communicative, and paranoid. Nevertheless, he was a conservative, well-connected Catholic Republican, reputedly a strong crime fighter who had pursued tough anti-gang strategies while serving as a prosecutor with the Alameda County District Attorney's Office. All that, apparently, was good enough for Newsom. Picking Ryan to head up the city's Office of Criminal Justice represented a reach across the aisle in deference to the tough-on-crime crowd from Orange, Riverside, and Los Angeles counties. Otherwise, Newsom's future political opponents would likely succeed in portraying him as a panty-waist mayor from the city of Gay Pride who rolled over for thugs and bullies. While Ryan's appointment to the mayor's administration provided a tough-on-crime veneer, it also allowed someone from the Republican opposition inside Newsom's tent when a huge public controversy over San Francisco's sanctuary city policy and its negative effect on combating violent, illegal immigrant gangs soon sprang to national attention, Ryan's natural political loyalties would only make Newsom desperate attempts at damage control more difficult. By the start of 2008, the Operation Devil Horns team had already started taking the most murderous 20 street gang members off the streets picking them off one at a time on various state charges with the help of Cabrera, Gibson, and a handful of SFPD cops who occasionally risked their careers. In this way, the thugs could be held in local custody until RICO indictments were nailed down and the gang members could be transferred to federal custody. Belencito and Psycho were incarcerated now, and so was Capone. Getting the most violent clique leaders off the street, so the theory went, would also keep the gang disoriented and less likely to organize major attacks. But being locked up behind bars did not prevent Cycle and Belencito from continuing to call shots for the clique, a situation that became obvious to the Devil Horns team as they monitored Belencito's speakerphone address from jail to a meeting of new booties in Mission Playground. 
During the call, Pelincito expressed to the new crew how proud he was of the way they were taking care of business in his absence. Other tap phone calls with Psycho and Pelincito while in jail, facilitated by various girlfriends and homies who patched him in through conference call services, revealed the two homies were still calling shots for the click. The main conduit for Psycho and Pelincito to manage gang business from jail now was Slow Pain, who took over as the clique's leader on the streets. Slow Pain was leading the new booties in a campaign to fully oust the clique's old guard, including a ruthless plan to murder Tigre, Joker, Goofy, and Droopy. Based on directions from Psycho, the new booties were also preparing to break off from 20th Street with the support of PLS in Richmond and to form a new clique based on 80th Avenue in Oakland. Psycho wanted to break out in his Psycho wanted to break out on his own, free from the constraints and baggage of the 20th Street clique. Startling incidents of deadly violence in the mission committed in plain view of the public were creating a growing sense of fear in the neighborhood. The rival Northaniels were brutal as well, equally capable of attacking and killing, as was proved once again by their fatal hit on an MS-13 Marrero named Maya. Maya had strayed onto Northaniel turf just long enough to grab a quick taco lunch and was gunned down right outside the restaurant where he ate his last meal. It was the first fatal hit on a 20th Street member since Memo was killed and it couldn't go unanswered. As a group from 20th Street stood discussing how to best retaliate against the Northaniels for the Maya hit, three of the enemies snuck up from behind. Hey you Sureño bitches, one of the Northaniels shouted. With that, one of them opened up with a semi-automatic handgun blasting away at the 20th Street crew as they scrambled behind benches and ran for cover. Bullets ricocheted off concrete and brick in the public space where nannies took their children to play in the fresh air and sunshine. Emptying the gun's entire magazine at relatively close range, the Northaniel only managed to hit one of the surprise MS-13 gang members, Triste, who was shot in the back. But in hitting Triste, the Northaniels had seriously wounded the cousin of Slow Pain, who was furious. He immediately contacted the PLS clique of MS-13 in Richmond and asked them to join 20th Street in getting some revenge on the Northaniels right away. Together, as a hunting pair, Popeye and Spooky were among the MS-13 loyalists to answer Slow Pain's call for retribution that night. Driving through the Excelsior District, they were looking for anything that remotely resembled a Northaniel when they spotted Ernad Joldig and Philip Ng sitting together in a parked car. The two of them fit the bill close enough. With Popeye behind the steering wheel, Spooky got out of the stolen white Mitsubishi and walked up to Jodic and Ng. The pair had just left another friend's house in the 200 block of Athens Street, near where Jodic used to live with his parents. Ng was a San Francisco native and a popular DJ at a nightclub in the city. Jodic was a graduate of Gateway High School where he distinguished himself as a math whiz. He moved to San Francisco as a young boy with his parents from their native Bosnia, escaping the civil war raging there at the time. Spooky pulling out a handgun and began firing into their vehicle, killing the young Bosnian immigrant almost instantly. Ng did not expire right away, but survived long enough to be taken to San Francisco General Hospital, where he finally succumbed to his gunshot wounds. Soon after the shooting, SFPD officer Rodrigo Labson and his partner, Brian Hicklin, were patrolling the street to the city's northern district in a squad car and stopped for a red light. Crossing in front of them, they saw a white Mitsubishi with tinted windows and a missing license plate on the front bumper. Labson's partner turned on the patrol car's flashing lights and they pulled right behind the car, which came to a stop at the side of the road. On the passenger side, Spooky emerged. Get back in the vehicle, Labson commanded. Spooky acted as if he didn't hear or understand. He turned to look down the street, then took off running. Labson chased after him on foot. As Spooky sprinted around the corner, heading north on Van Ness, Rounding the corner in pursuit, Labson saw Spooky heading down an alley right behind Olive Street and continued chasing after him. Running about 50 feet behind, Labson could see Spooky reaching around for something in the front of his waistband before he made another quick turn and sprinted down Polk Street. When Labson got to the corner of Polk, he spotted Spooky down on his hands and knees, fumbling with something on the pavement, his elbows and arms jerking around with the effort. 
The officer drew his firearm and ordered Spooky down on the ground, but he didn't comply. Lapson ordered him to get down again, but Spooky stood up with his hands empty in the air and walked several steps toward the officer before finally obeying the order. After putting handcuffs on Spooky, Lapson walked back to the spot where he'd seen him fumbling around on the pavement. There he saw the grip of a 45 caliber pistol sticking up from a sewer drain, its butt end slightly too big to fall through the steel slats of the grate. Spooky was out of luck by a few millimeters. Within moments, SFPD backup arrived to take Spooky into custody while Lapson took photos of the handgun which was loaded with ammo. He donned a pair of rubber gloves and placed the pistol into an evidence bag. Back at the patrol car, Hicklin had detained Popeye. When Lapson returned, he noticed a couple spots on Popeye's shoes that he suspected might be blood. The footwear was seized and placed in the evidence bags along with the blue bandana that Popeye had tucked into his back pocket. At SFPD's northern station, Labson consulted with his sergeant about the arrest and the strong likelihood that they were dealing with gang members. They contacted Cabrera, who showed up to check things out and took custody of Popeye's Mitsubishi and Spooky's handgun. Forensic tests on the gun later determined it was the same one used to kill Ernad Jolik and Philip Ng. Spooky and Popeye were both initially booked by the city DA on felony weapons charges for participating in a criminal street gang. Federal prosecutors soon added a charge against Spooky of being an illegal immigrant from Guatemala in possession of a firearm. All charges against Popeye were dropped, however, when San Francisco District Attorney Kamala Harris's office concluded there was no evidence Popeye knew the passenger in his car. Spooky possessed a gun. Popeye was released back to the street. It was a decision that soon would have disastrous ramifications for one San Francisco family after Popeye went straight back to work for the gang. Even though Operation Devil Horns had disrupted the leadership of 20th Street to a large degree, it clearly was not preventing the clique from regularly engaging in deadly violence on the streets, causing Santini continual angst. With slow pain in charge, taking orders from Psycho and Belencito in jail, the gang was as murderous as ever, even worse. Santini and Gwen were pushing old cases of violent acts as well as the recent ones through the grand jury in an effort to rope in as many gangsters into the federal indictment as possible. Long hard days in the grand jury as the crazy violence continued on the streets were wearing on them. With bloody attacks occurring almost daily between the two gangs, Martin Guerra a 22-year-old Nathaniel was riding through the mission with his sister when he decided to roll through 20th Street territory and taunt whatever MS-13 crew he might come across. It was his bad luck that Droopy, Goofy, and Joker happened to be loitering together in front of the Ritmo Latino record shop on Mission Street. Fuck you, Screezos, Geta shouted at them from the car. The three MS-13 gangbangers turned and spotted the brother and sister pair as they drove past. They saw Guerra flash the Northaniel hand sign and the trio from 20th Street, including Joker, with his paralyzed arm hanging limply, gave chase on foot. The vehicle came to a stop at a red light down the block. Rupi got there first and began pounding Guerra with his fist through the open passenger side window. Guerra's sister tried to drive away but the road ahead was blocked by traffic and she only managed to plow into a parked car. Goofy reached the piled up car next, moving between Droopy and Guerra and pulling out a knife. He plunged it into Guerra's gut, then ripped upward all the way to the breastbone, the way a hunter disembowels a deer. If not for the several layers of clothing that Guerra was wearing that day, his vital organs would have spilled out of his abdominal cavity right there in the car.